Hello and welcome to this lecture on mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. My name is David Smith and I'm a program specialist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension in the Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering at Texas A&M University. In the previous lesson, we looked at some of the contributions of greenhouse gases from different types of livestock and poultry operations. We saw that in the U.S., animal agriculture has dramatically increased its production efficiency as it continues to produce more product with fewer resources. We should also now recognize that the overall carbon footprint of agriculture is relatively small compared to other sectors of the economy, such as transportation. While this is true, animal agriculture is often called upon to defend its impact on the environment and therefore must continually demonstrate its commitment to stewardship. One way to do this is to identify and adopt best management practices that continue to improve production efficiency while at the same time reduce its share of greenhouse gas emissions. In this lesson, we will define what we mean by mitigation in the context of greenhouse gas emissions. We will discuss the different mitigation options available to farmers and ranchers, and we will discuss how some of these mitigation practices might have other environmental and financial benefits beyond just reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Let's start out by defining what we mean by mitigation in the context of this lesson. Mitigation is defined as any practice that reduces the amount of heat trapping gases, called greenhouse gases, from being released into the atmosphere. Let's take a look at some examples from other industries. In the airline industry, they talk about mitigation in terms of flying fewer miles by improving flight schedules or improving the fuel efficiency of airplanes. In the energy sector, mitigation options might include cleaner burning fuels, such as drilling for more natural gas compared to mining more coal, as well as improving energy conservation throughout an electrical grid. Manufacturing facilities might look at carbon capture methods or improving the production efficiency through automation and control technologies. And with agriculture, we might consider soil carbon sequestration and improved fertilizer efficiency, which improves crop production while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So if you look at animal agriculture from a big picture perspective, there's really four main categories of mitigation practices. First, we can look at production efficiency, producing more output of meat, milk, and eggs per unit input. Second, there's a lot we can do to improve manure management practices that not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but at the same time address water and air quality concerns. Third is energy efficiency. As we continue the trend for more controlled environments within animal ag production, there's a growing need to become more energy efficient in our lighting, heating, and cooling systems. And finally, a win-win for farmers is carbon capture and storage also called carbon sequestration. We can do this by increasing organic matter in soils and maintaining cover crops on our pastures, crop, and rangeland. One of the key challenges in selecting mitigation practices for livestock and poultry operations is that animal agriculture is extremely diverse. This is true even within a given animal species. Just look at beef cattle operations. You have confined feeder operations, cow-calf operations, and stocker operations. You also have seed stock and niche market to consider. With each of these, you're dealing with different environments from non-vegetative feedlots with high-density stocking to pasture and rangeland environments with variable stocking rates. Where greenhouse gas emissions occur and what mitigation options are most appropriate will also change with the type of operation. Mitigation options are also somewhat dependent upon location and climate. For example, dairy operations in the southwest vary considerably compared to dairy operations in the northeast part of the country. And again, whether the dairy is confined, pasture-based, or mixed will determine which mitigation options might be appropriate. Or with swine, we have several phases of the, or types of operations, both in confined and open facilities, which might be a farrow to finish, feeder pig producer, or a feeder pig finisher. So what we must recognize is that each type of operation produces greenhouse gases in different amounts and at different points along the production system. 
mitigation practices must consider farm level management and environmental factors to be truly effective and affordable. So if we look at beef operations, uh, some of the overarching goals is that we have a more efficient cattle production. In a cow-calf operation, it all starts with improving fertility, pregnancy rate, and successful deliveries through good breeding practices. Maintaining a, a healthy herd also results in fewer cold cattle and lower mortality rates. This minimizes feed and pasture resources spent on unhealthy cattle and replacements as well as reducing overall greenhouse gas emissions. Faster weight gain through improved pastures and supplements is also important, and we can do this through improvements in their diets. Not surprisingly, these are some of the same practices ranchers already do to increase the profitability of their operations. Most of the direct greenhouse gas emissions in beef operations come from two sources, either enteric fermentation, where methane is expelled during digestion, or manure management. There has been a lot of research exploring dietary additives such as ionophores, oils, and vaccines to reduce methane formation in the rumen, which will also increase feed efficiency. Animal manure can also release significant amounts of methane and nitrous oxide during storage. We'll take a look at some mitigation options for manure management uh, later on in this lesson. In dairy operations, one key approach to reducing greenhouse gas, gas emissions is increasing the lifetime production efficiency of the cow. Improved genetics and artificial insemination of dairy cattle has greatly improved our ability to identify and select for breeds that are genetically superior for milk production. The most common breed, dairy breeds in the U.S. are those that produce high milk solids such as Jersey and Guernsey and Holstein that tend to produce more volume. It takes about two years before a cow is ready to produce milk, and so we have a lot of resources invested in that cow, and we want to make sure that she has the most efficient, productive life. We can also decrease that initial period of time by having earlier calving. We can continue to improve dairy diets and improve overall herd health so that we have fewer culls, and reduce cow stress uh, to increase productivity. The dairy industry as a whole has been very proactive in investing in manure management techniques, primarily due to regulation, but that can also be effective at mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, as we'll see later, methane captured from manure storage facilities is sometimes used to provide on-farm power generation for things like heating and cooling systems. In swine operations, we want to continue to improve feed efficiencies and improve the number of piglets weaned per sow over her lifetime. Again, we have resources invested in growing that sow, so we want to make sure that she has a good, uh, long, productive life. We also want to continue to improve herd health and reduce animal stress, and in confined housing, improve our building energy efficiency which can involve regular fan maintenance and energy efficient cooling and heating systems. Manure management systems specifically designed to capture and utilize manure methane will be discussed later. Much of the greenhouse gas emissions from poultry operations originate from burning fossil fuels uh, used to produce electricity, power combustion units such as furnaces and incinerators, and to power trucks, tractors, and generators used on the farm. Methane and nitrous oxide emissions also occur during manure handling and storage. A University of Georgia study found that the mitigation practices should be evalu evaluated on an individual farm basis and that the relative amounts of greenhouse gas emissions varied depending on the type of poultry operation. For example, the study found that about 68% of emissions from broiler and pullet farms came from propane use while only 3% of emissions from breeder farms were from propane use. Propane is mainly used for heating purposes. Reducing heat loss in poultry barns is key to reducing propane use. For houses without walls, insulated curtains help to limit heat loss, while for enclosed houses, walls and ceilings can be insulated. On breeder farms, the same study found that about 85% of greenhouse gas emissions were a result of electricity use for lighting and ventilation. Improving energy efficiency of, of exhaust fans, lighting, generators, and incinerators can reduce the total amount of electricity use 
thus resulting in fewer emissions. Other mitigation options include installing circulatory fans to prevent temperature stratification and using radiant instead of gas heaters for brooding. Manure management within all of these animal systems has several similar options we can look at to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. When manure is in storage, it's releasing greenhouse gases, so one goal should be to reduce storage time. Separating the solids and the liquids also reduces the amount of emissions that are given off. Capturing those gases that are being released through covered storage is another good option. Composting reduces bulk, pathogens, and controls odors and is also a useful soil amendment. Land application of liquid manure to crop and pastures using techniques such as soil injection reduces nitrous oxide emissions by re minimizing manure nitrogen contact with the air and reducing nitrogen losses from leaching or runoff which result in subsequent nitrogen oxide emissions. Covered manure storage and methane capture is another good option for offsetting some greenhouse gas emissions. Captured methane that would otherwise be released into the atmosphere can either be flared where it is burned and converted to carbon dioxide, which if you remember is a less potent greenhouse gas, or used as a renewable energy source to run a generator to provide on-farm power. Like cover manure storage systems, anaerobic digesters provide a means to reduce methane emissions from animal manure that would have been emitted into the atmosphere and using it to generate power for on-farm and off-farm uses. There are several different types and designs of anaerobic digesters that can be customized for different livestock and poultry operations and customized for site-specific conditions. Some of these are plug flow, covered lagoons, and complete mixed digesters. Basically, the way they work is by separating the biogas, which is mainly methane, from the solids and liquids portion of the manure. The biogas is then conditioned to remove moisture and hydrogen sulfide and can then be used to power electric generators, boilers, heaters, or chillers. Heat and electricity generated can be used for farm or home use, or in some cases sold to energy companies. The solids and liquids portion of the manure can then be separated. Liquid can be stored in lagoons and used with irrigation as fertilizer. Solids can be used or sold as organic fertilizer, compost, or bedding material. So while this technology is still cost prohibitive to many farmers and ranchers, many of the benefits of anaerobic digesters should be weighed against the initial capital expenses. So while reduced greenhouse gas emissions is important, there are other benefits such as better control of manure odors, renewable energy generation, as well as potential revenue sources such as reduction in energy purchase, sale of excess electricity or biogas, value-added products such as fertilizers and compost, and the potential value of carbon credits. This system also reduces manure pathogens and improves water quality. For those livestock systems that are on pasture and rangeland, there are several different options that can improve our ability to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as well as sequester carbon in our soils. Grassland systems are one of the most productive systems for sequestering carbon into the soil. One of the most important things ranchers do, especially with beef cattle, is utilize appropriate stocking density to maintain vegetation that can sequester and utilize carbon. Rotational grazing as part of intensive pasture management is also showing promise in maintaining healthy pastures. In some parts of the country, silvopasture is considered a mitigation option. This is where trees are strategically planted within a pasture system and cattle are allowed to graze among the trees. This gives the benefit of shade to the cattle, which tends to increase productivity, as well as having a double cropping system on that acreage. And finally, we want to make sure that the land application of manure and nitrogen fertilization to grazing land is appropriate, is appropriate to reduce the emissions of nitrous oxide, which is a potent, uh, potent greenhouse gas. There's a lot of organic matter within those manures that can be sequestered if it's applied at the proper rates using good application methods. Fertilization should start with a soil test to determine nitrogen deficiency in the soil and balance that with the appropriate needs of the forage. Other practices include using slow-release forms of fertilizer, scheduling the timing of fertilization with plant uptake, 
and placing the fertilizer more precisely into the soil so that it's more accessible to the plant roots. Several efforts are underway to identify mitigation practices for animal agriculture production. Arkebeck and others in a 2012 report summarized the current state of mitigation alternatives for beef, dairy, and swine operations. In addition to the practices we've already discussed, they listed several new and emerging ones where further research is needed before widespread implementation. In their report, they looked at such things as changes in grazing systems, feeding strategies and diets, and manure management. The authors felt more research should focus on the mitigation potential of changing from traditional pasture grazing systems to intensive feedlot systems. For feeding strategies, they suggested more research be done on dietary supplements, such as lipids, ionophores, plant compounds, and probiotics and organic acids as well as improved genetics to help animals use feed more efficiently and reach maturity quicker. In swine, reducing dietary protein warrants further study. For manure management, they recognize that the cost of changing manure handling systems presents a big burden for many farmers and ranchers. But mitigation practices that are showing promise include manure compaction, aeration, optimizing the timing of manure spreading, and for swine operations, looking more at solid liquid separation systems and optimizing bedding materials for dry manure management. The complete report is listed under the required readings portion of this lesson. In it, you'll learn more about these emerging mitigation alternatives. So in summary, mitigation is any practice that reduces the amount of greenhouse gases released into the atmosphere. The four main categories of mitigation we've discussed here are improved production efficiency, manure management, energy efficiency, and carbon sequestration. However, we should remember that every farm and ranch is different and that the mitigation practices should be tailored to the specific species, type of operation, and the local environment. Finally, while we recognize that some mitigation practices are currently cost prohibitive, we should also weigh the additional environmental and financial benefits including the potential to sell biogas or electricity to off-farm users or market manure byproducts such as compost and organic fertilizers. Thanks for your time in this lesson. Additional fact sheets, videos, and website links with more details on mitigation options for different animal species are listed under optional reading and reference material. Please continue by completing the quiz and required reading.